Hello and welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and the executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2021 New York City election cycle is well underway and it's poised to be the most significant municipal election in decades. All of city government is on the ballot and because so few incumbents are eligible to run for their current seats due to term limits, New Yorkers are electing many new office holders and the next roster of leadership for our city. There will be a new mayor of New York City elected here in 2021, as well as a new city controller, several new borough presidents, and many new city council members. And that's not all that's on the ballot. A number of incumbents are eligible for and seeking re-election, including my guest today, the city's public advocate, Jamani Williams. There's also a very crowded and competitive race for Manhattan district attorney, and still more. Party primaries are set for June, and the general election in the fall will culminate on November 2nd. This is the first full set of municipal elections that will feature both early voting and the new ranked choice voting system. Now, ranked choice voting only applies to party primaries and special elections, and we'll have a separate show just on ranked choice voting. This city election cycle would be of enormous importance under more usual circumstances, but it's unfolding at a time of great crisis for our city, raising the stakes of the decisions that you, the voter, will make. This next wave of city leadership will quite clearly make or break the city's recovery from the devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic and its many impacts on health, families, jobs, education, housing, and much more. It's also important to note, of course, that New York City faced a number of crises even before COVID hit. Some of those only worsened during the worst of the pandemic. So it's an important time of choosing here in New York City, even as significant federal and state aid comes to the city. I'm pleased to bring you this series of interviews with candidates running for citywide offices, mayor, public advocate, controller, as well as interviews with candidates for other offices like borough president and district attorney. And there will be debates, especially for city council seats. So these one-on-one -on -one conversations, though, will help you get to know the candidates better, learn about their backgrounds, their platforms, where they stand on key issues, and their vision for the future of the city. We hope this and other interviews help you sort through your choices and make informed decisions when it's time to vote in the June primaries and fall general election. So today we're focused on the position of New York City public advocate. The public advocate is a citywide elected post, first in line to become the mayor if there's a vacancy in that office. The public advocate is meant to be just that, an advocate for New Yorkers, a watchdog over city government, especially the mayoral administration, and other entities that impact the people of the city, an ombuds person that New Yorkers can go to with problems, and an official task with proposing solutions to make government work better for the people. The public advocate is a non-voting member of the New York City Council with the power to introduce and co-sponsor legislation. The public advocate appoints members to several boards and commissions, including one member of the New York City Planning Commission, among several other responsibilities and powers as outlined in the New York City Charter and also embraced more informally by those who hold the office. It comes with a significant bully pulpit. So joining me now by Zoom is the incumbent public advocate, Jumani Williams, a Democrat who's seeking re-election this year. Public advocate Williams, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to be on your show, Ben. It's good to see you. You too. So, uh, a little overview of your time as public advocate so far. Uh, you've been in the position a, a little bit now. Uh, what would you say um, you've been able to do? Obviously the pandemic interrupted so much, changed the focus in some ways, not all, for, for so many people. Um, but give us a little overview of what you think you've been able to do both pre-pandemic and during this crisis that hit the city. Well, I believe we're, we're just about uh, two years in, in the office uh, after we won a special election. Uh, as soon as we came in, uh, we realized uh, our uh, dear friend, Tish James, who elevated to attorney general, was nice enough to take about 90% of the staff that were there. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. So we spent a, a good time staffing up uh, and very proud of the awesome team that we had. Just as we uh, staffed up and were starting to get things rolling, the pandemic hit. Uh, and so I think it threw a lot of folks off kilter. Uh, and then we spent, obviously, just like everyone uh, in the past year, uh, trying to really battle through this. Uh, and I think we we've done a really good job. First thing we we kept the, the the words we said in the campaign, which is we wanted to restructure the office and really focus. Uh, you know, I have a community organizer background, uh, so we've really expanded the community engagement team and as, as a robust organizers uh, across the city, which has been very helpful in making sure that we're 
staying in tune with what's going on and what policies that needed to be pushed on behalf of everyday New Yorkers uh, who sometimes don't have their voices heard. So I think we've done that very well. But we've been leading voice on how best uh, to move forward during the pandemic. Uh, some of those things have been listened to, sadly, uh, not all, and there's been a human cost to that. Uh, we uh, are proud that the partnership we've had and the thankful for the partnership we had with the leaders in the city council, we passed a 13 piece of legislation so far. It's actually more than any other uh, public advocate in the entire tenure. So we're very proud of that. And we put out a number of, of reports as well uh, and really trying to use that bully pulpit when it comes to issues of uh, reinvestment, uh, reinvigorating uh, our city and uh, public safety and gun violence. So let's unpack several of those things. Um... In terms of the legislation, let's start there. What are a couple of highlights that you've been able to, to pass, as you mentioned, in a, in a pretty significant number of bills there? Uh, we've worked on a, on a broad uh, broad band of issues, uh, the Fair Chance Act 2.0, uh, which left out a group of folks uh, that weren't in the original Fair Chance Act, uh, which basically uh, made sure that everybody, uh, you can't ask people questions about uh, their employment. Uh, we've uh, banned, uh, this is, before the state did their awesome job, banned the ability to uh, test uh, people have THC in their in their blood. We evened it out with uh, most jobs just the same way uh, when it comes to alcohol. You can't come to work high or drunk, uh, but I'm not sure testing to prevent somebody from getting a job is what you would do. We've done things like increase the fines uh, when it came to placard abuse, and so there's been a we've we. Um, created even more safety measures for site safety managers on construction sites. Uh, so we've had a broad a breadth of uh, things that we've tried to cover. I'm most proud actually of uh, the work we've done around gun violence and, and to the mayor's credit, uh, instituted another, uh, another pilot program uh, to try to address that gun violence the same way we did almost 10 years ago. It's had a, had a great effect. Uh, before we come back to gun violence, you, you have a couple legislative priorities that haven't passed, that haven't moved. You have a a bill where you want um, to mandate that the city studies racial impact before uh, a rezoning goes through. And then you have a paid personal time, uh, paid personal leave bill. Um, both of those seem to maybe have some momentum, I, I, I suppose, before the, the pandemic hit. Uh, a lot of things have been on pause, although both of those, you know, had a lot of a lot of pushback from some. Are those two things you're hoping to accomplish coming up? Do you have any sense of if they'll if they'll move this year before the end of this city council? Well, you know, we have a, actually a, a lot of bills that we're, we're open, we're able to push. And I've seen the state actually, uh, congratulations to them, are trying to take up the issue of co-op discrimination. We actually have uh, some of those bills right now in the city council. I'm hoping that we may be able to push some of those. But to the bills that you mentioned, you know, we have to work with our small businesses and we definitely want to do that. They need a lot of assistance. Uh, but we do think uh, that this pandemic has illuminated like no other time, the need for employees to take uh, time off, to take uh, uh, paid uh, personal time when needed, not just uh, for a, a sickness that you can identify. Sometimes you just uh, have some other things associated uh, with your family. And we've seen that happen time and time again during the pandemic or uh, mental health days are mm -hmm. enormously important. I think people understand that even more uh, than ever. So we wanna continue working with small businesses as well as uh, work advocates to define the line that works there. Uh, the racial impact study, I absolutely hope uh, passes in the next few months. It's, a, it's an extremely important a piece of legislation as we're trying to hopefully put new systems in place so that we don't return to normal, but we return to better than normal. And all the rezonings that we've had before, I don't think it's brought the city to a good place. And so racial impact study before any rezonings makes sense. I'm, I'm proud of um, the work that we've done with uh, Cuff and other advocates. And I wanna shout out the land use chair, Rafael Salamanca, who's on the bill and championing it. And I'm hoping that we can push forward. Uh, there is no, no reason why this bill uh, shouldn't move forward and hopefully move forward expeditiously. And I want to shout out the, the uh, Black Latino Asian Caucus who's made this a priority uh, as well as the Progressive Caucus as well. Mm -hmm. So on, on either of those bills, do you, do you have a, a, do you think they're a strong chance or you're just not sure at this point? 
I'm not sure where we are with uh, paid personal time. But, mm -hmm. uh, I feel good about racial impact study, but as you know, uh, we've uh, I've, uh, over my tenure had some quote unquote uh, controversial bills that take some time to get through. Uh, but I, I feel good about the racial impact study. Uh, we've had a great partnership with the uh, city council, and I'm really hoping uh, that continues with this bill, uh, especially as a lot of people are, are running for office. Uh, this is a great piece of legislation uh, to say you've helped pass through. And, and just quickly, I, I guess we skipped over it a little bit. Why is it so important? Well, as I mentioned, you know, we've had a lot of rezonings in the city and all of those rezonings we were told was supposed to make the, the city better. Uh, we believe it is part of the reasons uh, we've seen so much gentrification. We've seen an increase now uh, in, in uh, homelessness and lack of real income targeted affordability. This, the things that uh, the rezoning was supposed to help, uh, but it hasn't. And, you know, I've been, I voted against what's called mandatory inclusionary housing, uh, one of five people, uh, I believe, to do so. And we said then what I think many people agree with now, it just wasn't going to be enough. Now, it's not the only answer. Rezonings and building is not the only answer. Preservation is extremely important. But to the extent that it is one of the things we have to do, we have to do it smartly. I don't think we have. And we have only anecdotal evidence of the impact it has on people in those communities. And, and sadly, it's really along racial lines. And so if we do environmental studies, there should be no reason that we don't figure out what is the racial impact of something before we do it. Now, uh, on one hand, in a lower income community of color where, where so many of the rezonings under Mayor de Blasio have occurred, as you noted, um, you know, racial impact study might show uh, Black and Latino residents might be more adversely impacted by this, this potential rezoning. It needs to be either rethought or scrapped. And here's the evidence that this helps show. But some, a lot of folks are arguing that instead of rezoning in those communities to begin with, for the most part, the city should be looking at rezoning, upzoning, more housing development in whiter, wealthier communities. Do you support that refocusing of how upzonings have been done recently in the city? I always like the word uh, and. Uh, I don't know that we have to do always one thing. I think we, and I know we must do uh, more than one thing at the same time. It is right to point out that we focused on the lower income and black and brown communities. Uh, and that's problematic because in the other communities, you actually have, uh, it's, it's a, you have more uh, chance uh, to actually build deeper affordability based on, on uh, the, uh, the, the, the crossing, uh, the, the cross economy of the, how much you can charge for rent to subsidize some of the lower income rent. And that's right, that's, that's where mandatory inclusionary housing is actually supposed to be used, right? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. where the market rate can help pay, pay for the, the lower income housing. That's precisely the point. Yeah. Uh, but we haven't done that. It's politically difficult, uh, but not impossible. You just have to have the courage uh, to move forth. What I found, and it's funny, I asked people these three questions, and it's the same answer, actually, wherever you go, low income, high income, white, black. The first is, do you think housing homelessness is a very uh, pro big problem in the city? Hands go up. Do you think one of the answers is to have more income targeted affordable housing? Hands go up. How many people want a taller building in the center? Nobody raises their hand. So that those three questions answer the same. And that says to me, we just have to have a conversation. And the fact of the matter is contextual zoning is important. If we look the same way we did 100 years ago, we wouldn't be New York. And if we look the same way 100 years from now, we would have failed the people who are coming after us. But that doesn't mean you have to throw up skyscrapers in places that have one or two family homes. You have to have a conversation with folks about where it is they think they can give up some density. And then we have to push that through. And I think we've had a We've not done a good job of pushing those conversations in, in places that don't want to have them. Uh, but we also uh, haven't done a good job of engaging in most places. We usually, we usually come with a preset plan. And that's what we're doing. And that just doesn't work. We have to talk about this in, in a better way. All right. There's so much more to discuss there. And, and housing has been you know, among your top couple of issues. But uh, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll have a few minutes to come back to that. But I don't want to leave out other things. And, and of course, the other top issue you've already mentioned that you focus so much of your work on is gun violence and public safety. So we're talking right now in April 2021. We've seen this spike in gun violence over the last 15 months, really. Um, uh, starting a little bit before the pandemic set in, but certainly, you know, throughout the, the months and, and now year of the pandemic. What do you attribute that to? And 
how do we how do we solve it? How do we bring it down? You mentioned um, you know there, there's the violence interrupter programs that you've uh, backed. Those, some of those have been in place. Some of them are being ex expanded. There's a new advanced peace model that you mentioned, a pilot program that was just announced. But say a little bit more about why you think this spike has occurred and what can be done to to combat it. Gun violence is an epidemic and is a public health crisis, and we have to call it as such. As you mentioned, it's, it's spiked up. We can't ignore it. I'm hoping to hear more mayoral candidates begin to talk about how they're going to address it. Uh, it's also a epidemic all across the country. So it's not just New York City that's dealing with this, but New York City should lead in how we address it. And one is the uh, supply. Our federal government has done a horrific job of the supply of guns into these communities. It's like trying to empty something with a bucket with a hole in it. Uh, and to be clear, it's not about illegal guns because every one of the illegal guns, quote unquote, was legal at some point. And so it's about the legal access to just all guns that you want in this country is a problem. Uh, and then the demand, what is causing the demand and the pension for violence? Now we have had, we did such a great job up until last year, uh, especially when the pandemic hit. Uh, we were at historic lows when it came to gun violence and came to murder. We knew those numbers sadly would at some point ebb and flow because the violence does that. Uh, but no one, I think, anticipated the type of spike we would have seen here and all across the country. And so we need everybody at the table now. And law enforcement is an important role here. And so anyone who tries to pretend that it's not, is not being honest about the conversation. But what we've seen uh, previously was these communities get sandwiched between real street violence and over-policing on, on, on everything that's going on in their community. And actually, if they dare to talk about the over-policing, they get threatened with under-policing. And we don't need that either. We want law enforcement to do their job that they're hired to do. Uh, and we want to support them with real transparency and accountability. What we do know is simply throwing law enforcement at the, the problem actually doesn't help in the way that people think. They are good to help with acute situations, but it's a long-term de dependence on them that causes problems. And we have people 30 years later apologizing for the way they tried to address spikes in crime 30 years ago. And we shouldn't do that this time. And so there's a multi-pronged approach that has to happen that includes law enforcement, that includes uh, our, 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 uh, quote unquote justice system uh, with the DAs and with the courts, but also includes funding organizations and programs that are evidence-based that we know works. That last part has been very problematic. For the second time in, in, the, in two years, uh, this budget right now in, includes an increase, increase in NYPD, but it includes a decrease in so many other agencies, including the Division of Youth Community Development, including the Department of Education, including uh, the Department of Mental Health and, and Hygiene. That's the wrong message to be sent. So people get caught up in defund the police and, and, and what does that mean? And what it really means is we have to make sure that all of the partners in public safety are funded properly. And we have to reimagine and redefine what public safety actually means and what keeps a community safe. Just, just to be clear, you're talking about the mayor's proposed budget for the next fiscal year. As we're talking, he has yet to release his executive budget plan, which will reflect the significant influx of federal dollars. So when, fo when folks are watching this, the, the budget conversation might be a little bit different, but you're talking about what's been proposed and, and the point still stands in terms of where, where we were at during this conversation. Um, so, Let's, let's pull a couple of pieces of that apart though. What is the role for law enforcement? The, the neighborhoods, the zip codes where gun violence has spiked are still mostly the neighborhoods and zip codes where gun violence is higher than other parts of the city, even when the rates were lower. What is, what is the proper role for police in those neighborhoods to try to reduce gun violence, not just respond to it, not just try to um, you know, catch the shooters after, but to, to prevent it? So the, uh, anyone who says the presence of an officer doesn't do anything is also not being honest. And so there are times when the presence of an officer, one, in some cases, makes folks feel better. And sometimes um, how you feel is even more important than what it actually is, because if you feel unsafe, that's a problem. But there are times when the presence of officers uh, don't do the job that we think it's supposed to do. There have been people who've been shot in front of police officers. And so, um, as you mentioned, what... The, the primary thing that they can do is actually 
you respond when things are happening, respond um, when there's an acute problem and an acute crisis. And quite frankly, those are dangerous responses. So we should honor the men and women who are going to risk uh, their lives to do that. But at the same time, we have to figure out what does proactive policing mean? It can't mean uh, the abuse is a stop, question, and frisk. What we need to be doing is making sure that police officers are speaking to their communities. The communities have to have a, a bigger voice in what it is they want to see police, because you've seen so much uh, emphasis on trying to over police these communities when it really, if you focus some of that energy just on the issues that the communities are saying right now, this is where we need assistance. I think you'd have a better uh, a better response. I like the fact now that um, we're allowing communities to have a bigger voice in who their commanding officer is. I think that's uh, going to be very helpful. I don't know that we have like real community policing, but I do like the neighborhood policing model uh, that's been that's been going forward, and that's the type of work that we have to do. But that has to work in conjunction with the other programs. And so, whether it's the crisis management system, the advanced peace model that we're trying to overlay. It's a, a multi-pronged approach, and I think that's what people don't understand. And very often, uh, one of the things that I bring up is many people have heard of the takedowns, and you know we won't go on to uh, some of the issues that uh, are problematic in, even there. But let's assume for the sake that everything worked perfectly, and you were only taking the folks who were causing the most trouble. What has happened though is now you have to come back three or four years later and do the same thing because nothing was done in that community to change the environment. And what happened is that people stepped into the voids that were there uh, and started unfortunately doing the same negative behavior. And mm -hmm. we all should be focused on what is the negative behavior? How do we change it? And the police can't be the only folks who are working on that. Now, the violence interrupter program, the crisis management system that you've advocated for and that's been expanded, why was that work not able to, to, to do better in keeping gun, gun violence rates down over the last year? Was there a gap there? Would it have just been worse if it didn't exist? But, um, but you know, there were so many forces uh, moving in the other direction, lots of unemployment, school closed, uh, you know, just the, the dislocation of society that was occurring. Um, but, but why weren't those programs better able to um, prevent th this significant spike that we've seen? The crisis management system actually was, until 2020, was doing a phenomenal job. As I mentioned, shootings were at an all-time low. In the areas that had uh, the actual uh, cure violence model, the gun violence was lower in those areas and actually all around the city. And so uh, we've seen these programs work. Uh, there's a map office that works in NYCHA uh, that actually is doing a lot of work and we've seen evidence based models there as well. Like you mentioned, the pandemic hit. Um, we've seen everything exacerbated from mental health to food insecurity to uh, housing insecurity. It's, it, it, it stands to reason that gun violence would have suffered as well. And that's precisely what happened. All of the things that you mentioned, uh, people being home, people not working, mental health. Everybody seems to be on edge right now. Even in the subways, and we talk about the uptick in certain crimes. We're not talking about the uptick in suicides, of people jumping in front of trains. All of these things are getting worse, um, and we have to account for it. And what I'm saying is that to account for it can't be the one methodology that seems to be the knee jerk because we need to do something. At least that knee jerk sometimes makes things uh, worse. And so all across the country, we've seen this spike in gun violence. We've seen this kind of spike before, and we just don't want to make the same mistakes that we've made. So we should address the, the things that you mentioned as well. We have to address, like last year in the middle of the pandemic, while we increased the police department, we cut some of youth jobs in half. Mm -hmm. We went from 70,000 to about 30, 35,000. That doesn't make any sense. We told the city that you can't hire. We told the Department of Health, you can't get any new nurses, no new doctors, nothing we proposed, except we can hire additional police officers. And so we just wanna have the message that yes, our law enforcement is extremely important and we have to support the work that they're doing. But we know for a fact from all over that simply throwing police at a problem is actually unfair to the police because they can't fix all these problems. And of course, it's unfair to the community that feels a brunt of, brunt of that. So you've released a, a pretty big plan uh, at the beginning of March, a renewed deal for New York City. Uh, it's got some of the some of the elements we've already been discussing here in it. Are there other highlights 
Um, it's an extensive plan. We, we certainly can't go through all the details. Folks can find it on the Public Advocates website. Uh, but your renewed deal for New York City, uh, trying to help plot out the city's recovery. Are there two or three other sort of headlines in that plan, most important priorities that you want to advocate for and try to see passed or funded in the coming uh, months? Well, uh, Ben, just like you, I know everyone's going to read every single word and every page uh, of that report. Uh, but I, I do think the main uh, focus was trying to remind folks, and this is it's a little different now because we got that infusion of federal money, but it was important to remind people that the way out of this is investment and not austerity. And so we model it off of the new deal that happened 90 years ago. Uh, when that's exactly what happened to get out of the Great Depression, people. There's, are, there's a lot of that modeling going on these days with the with the yeah. Green New Deal and and other such. Yeah, and they're, they're right to do so. And I mean, sometimes mm-hmm. it's just thrown around, but it's the correct way. Many people don't realize that the biggest expansion of the City University of New York, CUNY, uh, which I'm a part of alumni, happened actually during the Great Depression, uh, and that was because they knew uh, to get out of it, you had to invest in folks. And so we wanted to make sure that there weren't austerity measures that will push forward but actually great opportunities to invest in things that need to be invested in, as well as as you push to something like green energy, the jobs, which are mostly associated with the green deal, uh, can actually come out uh, of building infrastructure, not for the North Brooklyn pipeline, for the infrastructure of of dirty energy, uh, but infrastructure for clean uh, energy that we need to see. And so it's a win-win all around. Of course, there are some things we had to clean up uh, because the new deal uh, which uh, sometimes uh, pushed for uh, some racial excising, unfortunately, uh, where when it came to redlining, uh, was a part of the uh, a part of the system at that point. And you actually can look at where folks were redlined and who was hit the hardest uh, during uh, the uh, the pandemic. But we want to make sure that doesn't happen as well, right? So you want to have equity uh, and justice in all the plans that we push forward. You know, there's so there's so many different challenges in the city, but let, let's talk about NYCHA for a minute. In in your uh, in your renewed deal here plan, you have a number of things related to NYCHA. You including um, which everybody I think agrees on that NYCHA just needs to be managed better, that that repairs need to be done more quickly, and things of that nature. But one of the biggest thing NYCHA needs that you point out in the plan is somewhere 30, 40 billion dollars, and there's a federal bill to bring in roughly that amount of money. There could be more city state funding put in, but you seem opposed to all the other sort of uh, revenue generating models that the NYCHA leadership has put forward, including uh, some of this movement towards allowing private management of some of the NYCHA uh, complexes, including infill development, which would create opportunity for new housing, including some affordable housing on underused NYCHA land. Are you steadfast opposed to all those models that are in the NYCHA plan? I mean, what if what if the federal government doesn't provide $30 billion? I'm actually not. Um, I'm not steadfast opposed to all of them. Um, I do have a very healthy hesitation to just speeding through uh, all those plans, uh, the blueprint, all that, uh, because uh, we've seen bad things happen before, promises made and promises not kept. What I have said is that the tenants themselves should be leading the conversation of what happens. And there have been uh, one or two places where tenants said, you know, we want RAD here. And uh, the best thing there is to try to make sure that you get the most affordability as possible. You can't do these things and not get true income target affordability because then it doesn't make sense. And there's a lot of places where they don't want. And so we have to make sure that tenants are the ones leading this conversation and that they have all the information. But I do agree that just continually to say the federal government has to fund it, which they should, but while we're battling with that, night is starting to crumble and people are suffering and we can't allow that to happen either. And so we have to look at these plans and tune them up to make sure that all of the concerns are addressed uh, before we move forward and that tenants again are at the lead and tipping point of that conversation. So the leadership shouldn't be the ones driving it. It should be the tenants. They should present the plans that they have and let the tenants take a look at it in a very real way uh, and lead the conversation. We're also having a mayoral uh, election this year. Obviously, you will be uh, holding, if you're reelected, you'll be holding the next mayor accountable and tasked with that. 
What do you think are the most important couple of qualities the next mayor must have uh, in order to be successful uh, coming out of, of what we've seen over eight years from Mayor de Blasio and just the recovery from the pandemic? What are a couple of things you point to that are really essential for the next mayor? Well, you know, I, I do hope I get reelected. Uh, that's uh, my more focus in terms of our campaign and, and of course, doing the work of, of government. But I am looking for someone that has a very clear vision, um, a very bold vision, and uh, the experience to manage to move through uh, the boldness uh, in the political winds. And that's a tough combination to see. And I think um, you see varying degrees of those three things, um, of a vision, a bold, courageous, uh, and uh, being bold and courageous and having management experience. Uh, uh, you know, you see that in varying parts of uh, the candidates. Um, but, you know, also the main things I'm looking for are who has a plan for us to recover? Uh, that is based in, in investment and not austerity. Um, and who is going to be talking about public safety? It's a it's a very important time right now, uh, and you have to have someone that can really stand those winds on uh, all sides of you, of trying to really have a conversation about law enforcement's very real role, uh, as long as it's discussed with accountability and transparency, and re redefining and reimagining what public safety is while addressing this gun violence. That's not a small task. So I'm looking to see who best can provide that. And I'm looking at as a resident of New York City. Sure. All right, well, we're gonna to have to leave it there. A lot more to discuss down the line here as we get closer to the primaries in June, but uh, public advocate, Jamani Williams, thanks very much for taking the time. Thanks, uh, it's always a pleasure. Thank you, peace and blessings, love and light to everybody. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions for New York City voters are coming up in June and the fall. There's a lot on the line for all of us and the future of New York City. I hope this conversation and others are helpful to you as you get ready to vote. I'm Ben Max. See you next time.